This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Shocked, startled, stunned. Aston Villa 7, Liverpool 2. It's the Blood Red Podcast, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo, as we react to the Reds' worst defeat in some 57 years. High defensive line, error-prone goalkeeping, empty stadiums. All will be discussed and dissected as we somehow try to make sense of what happened at Villa Park. Alongside myself, Guy Clark, we have our Liverpool correspondent, Paul Gorst, straight-talking Joe Rimmer, and our chief Liverpool writer, Ian Doyle. No time for pleasantries today, guys. I'll come straight to you, Doyle. You were at Villa Park. What happened? Um, Liverpool lost 7-3. 7-2. See, I, I, I can't even count. Yeah, goals. Goals. Yeah. Um, it was just very strange, wasn't it? Very, very strange. Strange up to a point. If you actually watched the game, you'd have gone, well, that's, you know, fair enough. Liverpool were absolutely appalling. Certainly the way that they apparently defended. I mean, what we're going to have to get used to, we can come on to all the reasons for Liverpool's performance, but what we're going to get, have to get used to is something that I said on Twitter last week when City got beat 5-2 on by Leicester, that there's going to be loads of games like this. I mean, you saw two yesterday. I know United were down to 10 men against Tottenham, but you still wouldn't expect them to lose 6-1 at home. Certainly wouldn't expect Liverpool to lose 7-2 at Aston Villa. So, I mean, it was just... Even from the first minute, you could tell that Liverpool weren't at it. Whether or not that was because of what happened with, with uh, Alisson, they thought, oh, well, you know, we're going to be without our keeper for six weeks. Whether they were worried about the health of, of Sadio Mane and Thiago, we know that they've, you know, obviously both... Uh, contracted coronavirus, whether they were thinking, well, it could be me next, whether or not, I don't know. This might be something that happens to every squad, but there's still no excuse for the inability to run or the inability to follow a, a player, the inability to make the right decision. I mean, things were that bad for Liverpool. Uh, Virgil van Dijk had to make two slide tackles in the first half. And you could tell that he never does them because the first one he got injured and the second one he got booked. So, I mean, that's it. That, if you've got van Dijk going to ground, that tells you things that aren't quite right to I me. Mean, we could go through the entire team. It was only Mohamed Salah and Andy Robertson of the starters, in my opinion, who who deserved any kind of you know credit for what they did. The rest of them were just it was just it was impossible to fathom the way that Liverpool just collapsed. And in, in not so much in the first half, you know, teams can go down four one. I mean, you've seen you know as I said, we mentioned City and uh, and United then on the on the wrong end. Chelsea were 3-0 down at West Brom, weren't they? But they managed to turn it around in the second half, so there was still a chance in the second half Liverpool to do something, but for whatever reason, they just, certainly defensively, they just had no kind of cohesion, no kind of belief in what they were doing. And it did look as though they just had no legs, like they couldn't run at times. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, sure we'll get on to individual performances at some point, but I can't even remember Joe Gomez having such a bad game. Just uh, whether or not he was affected by what happened with Adrian in those op- opening minutes, the pass back pass to him wasn't great from the keeper. But that was only one nil. That doesn't mean you get beat seven two. So the other thing is we can't overreact because the reason everyone's so surprised is because it's such a freak result. And unfortunately, as I've just said before, there's going to be this will be slightly less freak in the sense that this is like the, probably the third one that's happened already this season. I mean, <laughs> look at Leicester. Leicester beat City 5-2, then lose 3-0 at home to West Ham. So you're going to get an awful lot awful lot of this. I mean, Arsenal won a few games as well. So it's a very strange season. But uh, but but in terms of sorry, in terms of Liverpool, I wouldn't be massively concerned by what happened, but I wouldn't be sweeped under the carpet going, oh well, it's just one of those things that happens. Yeah. Gorsty, your the headline on your piece after the game, no excuses and no mitigation. This was an utter embarrassment for Liverpool Football Club. Seems to be bang on nail on the head there. Yeah, well, I'm thinking back to that game against Stoke, the the infamous six one, and and even the mere mention of Stoke now is enough to make Liverpool fans wince and just remember that day in May 2015, and that that had a lot more reason to make excuses for it. Yeah, it was coming to it was the last game of the season. It was a long old season that hadn't yielded anything, and Brendan Rodgers is here. It looked like it was in its last embers and players were out of position and Raheem Sterling had dropped the boat so he wasn't in the team. Um Liverpool had no strikers, then Ray Cham was right back. You you could go through the entire team that day and, and basically make some sort of excuse as to why they got turned over so easily. But this there was no reason for why this happened. This was a Liverpool team with pretty much everyone fit and firing apart from obviously the captain and, and Mane who would normally start. 
Um, just an, an absolute shambles. And obviously, Allison is, is the big one, isn't he? If, if Adrian doesn't do that less than five minutes in, then who knows what what happens in that game. But um, as Doyle says, it wasn't the reason he lost because that was only one nil, and Liverpool still had you know eighty five minutes to get back into it. And every time I looked up from my laptop after you know writing one of the chances into our blog or whatever, there was another chance or another goal, and it was just it was incredible. Um, I've never known a performance that bad. From a team who were rightly regarded as, as one of the world's best, you know, up, for me they're up there with Bayern Munich as the best teams on the planet at the moment. And um, they went to a team who stayed up at pretty much the last kick of last season um, and conceded seven. So I thought he said it, it was a an aberration, it was a rarity, an off day, and whatever you want to call it. But I wouldn't be quite so sure of just kind of batting it away as one of those things because. Uh, it's not like they've lost three 0 which you can might explain that way. They've conceded seven against Aston Villa there, um, so much to be done. And I think it's just frustrating that there's two weeks now until the next game, and the next game is huge because they're going to a resurgence. Everton, they were top of the league, absolutely flying. You know, confidence is as high as it's been there for for probably the last ten years, and um, that derby now is taking on extra significance because it's going to be massive. Yeah, Joe, you've had a night to sleep on it. Is it made you clear your head or have you sort of stayed there stewing on it and got even angrier and angry with the result? I stewed on it a bit. I must have been. I woke up and sort of first had to remind myself that it wasn't all a dream. You know, it was It was such a strange result. And I agree with Doyle. I do think we're going to see a lot of strange results this season. And this is for Liverpool anyway, the first example of what it could be like and, and perhaps we'll see the reverse and Liverpool will, will put quite a few past somebody else but it was humiliating and I don't want to get carried away because I think you know you look at the reaction on, on social media and it can often be crazy mm -hmm. and you see you see people this and that and you don't want to disregard all the great work Liverpool done and how good they are as a team because of one humiliating defeat but my big worry is is really that as, as Gorsi just said but if you get beat 2-0 3-0 Perhaps even 4 0, 4 1, you can kind of put it down and, and say it was, it was an off day. But se to concede seven goals to, with all due respect, a team like Aston Villa, who, you know, escaped relegation by a single point, I think it was last year, it could linger. And I think it could play on the players' minds. And if you like Joe Gomez now, it's going to be very difficult for him to go into the next game, you know, should he start at Everton and not have a, a few confidence, confidence issues. And the same for the goalkeeper, you know. I think now there's going to be tremendous pressure on him going into the Merseyside derby, which is a game he's, unless they, they decide to play Keller, who's a very young man, and that would be a big risk in itself. He's more than likely going to play at Everton, and, and that's going to make things very, very difficult for him. So it's going to be interesting. I, I must admit, it was humiliating, and, and I've not enjoyed working today. You know, we, we, we can't escape the football. You can't switch off and... You know, in the past, you'd switch off and, and try and think of other sports or watch a film or whatever, but you can't do that in this job. And it's not been nice. And um, a few Evertonian mates have been on, um, one, in one in particular I won't name, but reminded me at every, every hour. So it's not been nice, but Liverpool are going to have to find a way of moving on and not letting this, letting this be a freak result, which is what it should be, and not letting it linger and not letting it creep into... Some more results because I think if they go and lose the derby now, the, the things could seriously get a bit tricky for Liverpool going forward. Yeah, plenty of questions thrown up after the game then, and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. But a number, of course, will put the way of Jurgen Klopp in his post-match press conference primarily. How did it all happen? And here's what he had to say after the game. So we have to take risk when we play offensively. It's absolutely clear. Um, it's completely normal, and that's, that's football and all this stuff. But you have to protect your risk. That's that's normal as well. Uh, these situations, and um, we didn't do that tonight. That means we had really nice chances, played really good football, came in the box, blah blah blah, blah in moments undefendable in the box, which is pretty rare. Um, but each ball we lost, wherever it was, was a massive counter attack, and directly a, a, a real a real problem. Well, nice of Jürgen to join us on the Blood Red podcast, of course, Steve. But it did seem as though every time sort of Liverpool did lose the ball in that midfield, they were wide open and Villa were there to counter them. And I don't know if it's fair to draw comparisons to. You were saying before, 
this can't just be sort of treated as as a one-off. And it made me sort of think back to the Watford game in February and Liverpool went there and weren't great and were opened up a number of times. There have been warning signs before. Maybe not something this bad, but there have been warning signs. <clears throat> they have. Um, it, it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you, you don't want to be... You don't want to be overly critical of a team who, since the beginning of the 2018-19 season, have picked up over 200 points in the Premier League. Obviously, Premier League winners comfortably by 18 points. Um, they've won the Champions League in that time as well. So you can't be too critical if they go and you know have an, an off day. But I think it was just the, the manner of it, conceding seven goals against a team like Aston Villa, who, who let's face it, are going to be probably embroiled down the, the, the bottom of the Premier League once again. It was just such a, <clears throat> a shock to the system. Uh, Watford game is similar, but this was just on a whole other level just because it wasn't a 3-0 that you can kind of bat away and just think, let's just get out of Dodge here and move on and forget about it and who's next. This was a, a humiliation. Uh, you know, first time Liverpool have conceded at seven since 1963. Uh, the worst ever results for defending champions um, really was just a... Uh, an aberration and hopefully it is an anomaly for the season um, but I think we will see across the board some more crazy results like that popping up because um, as they really alluded to it there just seems to be a little kind of air of <clears throat> the players aren't quite at 100% fitness at the moment the lack of fans is having a big impact um, on how teams are approaching games um, particularly away from home and um, we might just see a few more wild score lines like that across the season and hopefully Liverpool um, aren't on the receiving end like they were last night. They did concede, of course, three deflected goals, Doily, but were Liverpool almost lucky to get away with it only being seven? Watkins went through one and one. He hit the bar as well. It, it could possibly have been worse, could it? It, it could have been worse. I missed, I'm, I'm probably not going to make anybody happy here, but I actually thought it was quite funny by the end. It was like just it's like comedy football. You just thought, well, this is just it, it's it's just ridiculous, basically. And as Ghosty said, there will be more, as we've said. To, but I, I don't, Ghosty will agree with me on this. I don't think we can pop, properly portray how weird it is to be watching these games now with no fans. And the difference from last season to this season is that towards the end of last season, it was a novelty, and it's they played more than three quarters of the season anyway. They were just finishing it off. But this one's from the start. And you're now getting teams doing things that they wouldn't normally do. It's like, as far as I'm concerned, if there was fans in there, Liverpool would have still lost that game, but they wouldn't have lost 7-2 because they, I'm not saying they gave up, but there was a certain lack of effort and, and heads went down during the last half an hour. But if there was away fans there, there's no way they'd have, they'd have been allowed to do that because the fans would have been on the backs. So there is there is a sense of that. And would, would Villa have played? I mean, you have to give credit to Villa because they found a way to play against Liverpool and... Bear in mind that last season Liverpool needed to score too late on to win at Villa Park. And at home against Aston Villa, while it was behind closed doors, Liverpool were not particularly great in that game. I think they only won two, was it one nil or two nil in the end? But it was it was hard work, basically. And of course Villa beat the kids five nil last last year, which was a completely separate thing, but it still shows that they know how to beat Liverpool. And I'd actually be more concerned that Liverpool lost two nil, because that would be more of a you know, why did they lose the game? It seems a bit more, you'd be going into a bit more in depth rather than we're thinking of these like strange reasons for this finish in 7-2. But if it was 2-0, that would be what we term as a slightly normal defeat. And then that suggests other other problems. But Liverpool could have scored about six or seven, but then Aston Villa could have scored about 15. It was just, it was weird. It was like watching a game of FIFA in real time happening in front of us. It was just, it was a very odd game. And as we've just, all of us have just said, Liverpool can't just ignore what's just happened. And I think there are some issues, certainly with the high defensive line, they need to to look into that. I think Villa's deep runners, the midfielder, midfield, midfielder sorry, couldn't track them, which meant that Barkley and you know, certainly Barkley, Grealish at some points were just running on straight onto the defence. I mean, you've got Joe Gomez having a tough time already. He's got no protection, so that's not going to help. So I think that a little bit of a rethink is required, but you know, as as we could point out, Liverpool were missing quite a lot of not so much the top players, but it was the top characters in Allison, Henderson, and Mane, who you'd say probably the three strongest characters in their particular positions. And that kind of when you are having a bad day, you need them to be there to help see you through. So 
I think it'll be completely different when they play Everton in a, in a couple of weeks. And I think secretly Everton know that as well. Yeah, Joe, the Midland is, of course, came out with a famous quote, intensity is identity. And what Doyle said there, with the, the high defensive line, it's coming for a lot of talk post-match, as you'd expect. And it looked horrendous on the defence, but was of, as much of the problem, the fact that really in the midfield, it, at times it didn't really feel as though there was anybody there. As, as Doyle said, players were being able to play passes through and midfield runners not being tracked and therefore the, the defenders were then sort of left helpless. That's it. It wasn't a Liverpool midfield performance. Well, it wasn't a Liverpool performance, but it wasn't a Liverpool midfield performance that we, we've we become used to, was it really? There, there was no intensity there. I mean, Fabinho, it, it was strange because that was the midfield that, that started against Arsenal and played so well. Fabinho just wasn't his usual self. Wijnaldum went completely missing, which we're not really used to Wijnaldum going missing like he has done in, you know, he has done it in the past, I suppose, in away games, but he hasn't done it for the past couple of seasons. And he went completely missing. And Naby Keita had a, you know, I thought a really poor game. And just, he just doesn't do anywhere near enough off the ball, which I think is a real, real problem. So, I mean, the midfield was totally passed by, bypassed by Aston Villa and, and didn't get to grips with them at, at all. But the high line's a difficult one because it's something that I think, it, it, like zonal marking, it's quite an easy one that when you, when you, when it goes wrong, it looks really, really bad, doesn't it? And you can, you can see, the mistakes and you can see players being totally exposed. But when but when you when you consider that Liverpool have been using the high line now for at least two seasons, probably a bit longer than that, and the success that they've they've had using it, you can't dismiss it as a tactic and you can't expect Liverpool to suddenly stop using it. I do think there is a an element of teams starting to get used to it and starting to work Liverpool out a little bit. And and Liverpool have shown that when teams work them out they develop and that they they react and they come up with something new and they they've usually stayed ahead of the game Liverpool so you know I think it's up to them now to take this recent lesson and and apply it into training and find the next stage of their development but I don't think the high line will completely disappear and I don't think Klopp is the type to give up on a certain element of his philosophy just because of one heavy defeat I mean I'm not too sure people who've followed Dortmund a bit closely would probably be able to tell us, but you know, I'm not too sure the Dortmund, Klopp's Dortmund teams were on the end of such defeats. But I think if you look at Liverpool under Klopp now, they've had a few, you know, nothing like 7 2 against Aston Villa, but you know, Man City away a couple of times, um, Tottenham away, you know, they've been on the end of some heavy defeats. And I think Klopp's style of football, the high press, when it goes wrong, it does tend to go badly wrong, doesn't it? And you know, you think back to people like Benitez and Julio, they quite, quite often went on the end of such defeats because they didn't take such risks going forward. And we found out through Klopp that risks mean reward and Liverpool have won trophies. So I don't think we should disregard a, a tactic that has helped them win so many games. So it's one that you have to take your medicine and it's one that looks bad. But I think it's one that Liverpool will hopefully learn from and, and adapt in the next games. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see how that one does play out. But, Gorsty, come back to you. And a lot of people having their say on the high defensive line and, and basically saying as the game went on, why weren't why weren't the leaders in the time? So maybe Virgil van Dijk sort of saying, right, we need to change things up here, maybe not play quite so high and, and have a bit of that in-game management because that was maybe lacking for us to avoid being on the end of what was in the end of hiding. Yeah, that, that's the point. But it, it essentially comes from Klopp, doesn't it? Who um, has kind of worked and shaped his game plan with his assistance. And um, you can't really say it, it doesn't work or it hasn't worked. Um, we've done a QA and a on our, our website today and I've had a couple of questions saying, what do we think of the high line? And is it time to kind of bin it off? And, you know, you, you can't make excuses for yesterday, but generally it, it is working. There's little bill dominated possession. They push up, they squeeze up as high as they can and, and generally see a lot more of the ball. Um, and when they get pressed, they've got players who are comfortable enough on the ball at the back to to play the long passes and, and get themselves out of trouble with, you know, thinking of um, something Mikel Arteta said on Monday about Van Dijk playing that diagonal to Mohamed Salah and you know Trent Alexander-Arnold and, and Andy Robertson can do that as well. So um, it's not going to be something that's going to change. It's it's something that's served Liverpool well for, for a couple of years now and they've obviously had huge success with it. So I don't see a change on the back of this result, but... Um, 
I think it'll give other teams certainly a, a blueprint to try and stick to when, when they come up against Liverpool and it requires um, good time of runs, it requires pace and it requires timing of those runs and, and intelligence of when to make it and I think it's just a bit of a perfect storm with Grealish who, who I think is a, a fantastic player anyway and Ross Barkley was kind of at the bit between his teeth and was a, the player that he was in 2014 and Ollie Watkins coming in and, and you know bagging a Premier League asterisk after his move from, from Brentford. So I just think that we were kind of caught with the mobility and the speed of, of Aston Villa and um, absolutely deserved the hiding that they were given. Well, if it isn't the high defensive line, then Adrian's performance was certainly questioned after the game. Another thing that Jurgen Klopp was asked about in his post-match press conference is what he had to say on that. Yes, the first goal was not cool, of course. But apart from that, he was I don't think he had anything to do with all the other goals, pretty much. So we 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 we, we didn't help him tonight, let me say it like this, or we did him the opposite. And um so yeah, he's a he's a really good goalie who played last year, eleven games for us, and I think we won pretty much all of them if I'm right. And um so that's all fine. Um tonight was not our goalie was not the problem. Well, we got to see Jurgen Klopp's uh, beard there and he's his neck doily, but I suppose for <laughs> Liverpool fans, he, he was talking there about the fact that uh, Adrian, of course, did play during the, the first part of last season quite a fair bit due to that injury that Alison Becker picked up. And now, if Alison's going to be missing for four to six weeks, we know certainly in the short term that Adrian is more than likely going to be the answer. Well, he's the answer to a question I'm sure some Liverpool fans would, would pose a, a, another question of which he'd be the answer to. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's not going to be much change unless, as Joe said, whether Kelleher goes in. He's never played a Premier League game, although he's highly thought of. I, I can't see that happening, to be honest. So it's going to be Adrian. Um, I think Klopp's right. I mean, Adrian made a mistake for the first goal. That was one deal after five minutes. But I think what that then exposed was, I think, I'm not saying that, Liverpool's players don't trust Adrian, but I think there's certain players who play a lot better when it's Alice rather than Adrian. And I think Gomez is almost certainly one of them. And obviously, one, given what happened to him straight away in that game where he was put into a bit of trouble, that kind of set him back for the entire match. And I think what Klopp was saying there about we didn't react properly to to what, what happened with that first goal. Yeah, it was 1-0 after five minutes. There was still 85 minutes to go. They, they could have sorted that out, but they chose, they chose not, to, not chose not to, but they just couldn't. And I think... Again, wanted to give Villa credit. They, from the first minute, the way they set up, they knew they were going to attack. They thought, well, we'll have a go at Liverpool here, see what happens. And Liverpool had chances in the first half, just didn't take them. And Aston Villa did. I mean, anyone who saw the stats at half time, Liverpool had 75% possession and had more shots on goal than Villa had. But everybody who watched the game would have said, well, Liverpool are lucky not to be more than 4 1 down. So, as I say, it goes back to it being a slightly strange result. I mean, you're right about the, the high line. It looks bad when it goes wrong. And it has kind of, I know Roy Keane said there was some sloppy moments against Arsenal. And I kind of know what he was getting at. But Liverpool actually played really well that day. I thought I thought Liverpool in the first half in particular against Arsenal, which was, what, te- seven days ago? We're absolutely brilliant. So any all the way over reaction, you can't forget what's happened before. I think what some Liverpool fans are upset at is that it's exposed some of the issues that they were worried about, which was the lack of a what they believe is a decent backup goalkeeper and the lack of a fourth centre-back to, to be brought in because Gomez didn't have a good game. He went off after an hour, a bit of an act of mercy, I thought. Matip's injured and Fabinho, who, who hadn't been very good in midfield, he goes to centre-back, so that, that doesn't really answer you know, solve that particular problem because he was almost as bad as Gomez was throughout the game. So, I don't know. I mean, overall, Liverpool can just... What can they do with the goalkeeper situation? They, they can't do anything. It's going to have to be Adrian. Everyone's just going to have to shut up and get on with it. And Liverpool's players knew, as you say, last season, they won a lot of games with him in goal. Just have to get back to playing like that. And even if it means go stepping back two yards, not giving him the ball to his feet because he's not the best with his with the ball at his feet, trying not to play out from the back in that sense. Just change things around a little bit because, as, as Joe said, they've found solutions to problems in the past. So... They're just going to have to change this again. And I think while having two weeks the international break isn't great in the sense of it's allowing them to dwell on this result, with Adrian obviously not an international footballer, he can spend two weeks working with whoever at Melwood, whether it's on his kicking or on his positional play in that sense. And also to stop 
you know, to judge when a cross is coming in, then he can get it rather than run off and Wally Watkins comes in and it's the bar when there's nobody in goal. What was he doing? I mean, okay, it didn't really matter as so much, but the fact that in between he didn't do really, it really, if we're being honest, in between those two moments, he didn't really do anything wrong. It wasn't at fault for any of the other six goals. And he made a good save from, was it Grealish who went through? Went through, could have scored. It was, it was, you know, there was that many of them. It could, could have been any of the Villa players. But everyone remembers his first bit, which was to give away the first goal, and practically his last bit, which was to almost give away an eighth. So, you know, in that sense, not great. But as I say, Liverpool are just going to have to get on with it. I, th- I think that's a key point from from Doyley because one of the things I thought about the high line is that Liverpool do use it quite well, and with Allison in, it works, doesn't it? Because Allison is a such a presence. And B, he's quick off his line and good with his feet. So, you know, it's it's those like Dudley said, they have to adapt to that. And perhaps, yeah, perhaps they have to they drop back a little bit with Adrian and goal. Perhaps they they don't use their goalkeeper quite as much. But I do think it's a worry for Liverpool. A uh, backup goalkeepers they're quite hard to find, aren't they? And I think when you have a good one, they don't often stick around for long because they quite often want to go and play football. So, you know, I think Liverpool had a really good one when they had Simon Mignolet, but it was clear he was never going to stay around any longer than, than a season or so because he wants to go out and be a first choice. Adrian is at the stage of his career where he's happy to be second choice, but, you know, I'm not the type to, to like to scapegoat players at, you know, before. It's always upset me when I see the likes of Lovren or Lucas, people like that, you know, people point the finger at them and blame defeats on them. So, like Doyle says, you can't blame that defeat on Adrian, but I do think, <laughs> but saying that, I do think he is... He isn't quite good enough for Liverpool. I do think they have to have a think about that that second goalkeeper and and see what they can do in the, in the future because you know he's made some massive high profile errors in the last you know I think a little stat flashed up at the bottom of the screen just before is it five and twenty one you know I can you get the ones against Southampton the ones against Atletico uh, Chelsea in the FA Cup things like that just off the top of your head and just you know I would. I think back to Mignola and, and you know he wasn't perhaps great coming with the cross he wasn't as great with his feet but they weren't massive errors giving the ball away to opposition for them to to have simple goals and you know that's really difficult for, as a football team when you're gifting goals like that you know you look at look at last night they're immediately under the cosh after four minutes because of a terrible mistake against Atletico it was crucial because Liverpool had done all that hard work and were winning the tie and then from that moment he made that mistake it's so, so key because Liverpool go out. So I just don't think you can deal with errors that badly and that often. Um, you know, I don't think it's on the... I think because it's a goalkeeper, it, it, you see it, it. It's so obvious and it's so difficult to come back from. So I don't want to scapegoat Adrian. I don't want him to be the, the one that takes all the blame for yesterday's defeat. But I do think Liverpool need to find, you know, going into next summer, perhaps it's too late now or January, they need to have a little look at that goalkeeper position and see what they can do because there has to be other options out there. Um, but I do think it's a difficult transfer to pull off. Um, I don't want to labour the point too much because Joe kind of summed up the point that I was going to make there in terms of the appearances. But this is a keeper who's who's a reserve and he's played 21 times for Liverpool and he's going to play, what, 25 times before we see Alisson again. It's, it's just, it's unfortunate that Liverpool have kind of come unstuck with, with Allison's injury, really. You know, that first game against Norwich and then the sending off at Brighton, which meant that Adrian was in over the derby, which Liverpool comfortably won, but that could have been another tricky situation. And then he's played in, in you know, huge Champions League games when really, um, you know, your backup goalkeeper wouldn't be playing anywhere, anywhere near that much. So if Allison is, is fit, you know, like most first choice goalkeepers are, then Adrian's probably played less than 10 games for Liverpool. And it's just... Oh. Unfortunate that that has has been the way it's transpired, and um, as Joe mentioned there about the, the mistakes, there have been far too many for for such a short sample size of, of games. Um, so possibly that should be something that people are looking at at, at some stage. But um, as we're recording this, it's probably a bit too late in the day now for for someone to come in um, on transfer deadline day. Yeah, I was going to say to you, Gorsi, we we seven hours actually whilst we're recording over seven hours left for Liverpool maybe to do some shopping. But we spoke a lot when Liverpool did the business, certainly to bring in Diogo Jota. How it now wasn't as much of a drop off between say Sadio Mane and Diogo Jota. Is that now still the one position within the squad, Gorsi, in goal where 
you do see that drop off. That that stat that we've sort of seen on on the screen, Adrian with five errors in twenty one appearances. Alison Becker's only made five errors in his last 92 appearances. It, it is some difference. Yeah, it's just the way Liverpool play. Adrian, you know, is a vastly experienced goalkeeper. He's 33 and he's played over 200 times in the Premier League. But um, West Ham didn't play the way Liverpool played. That they were the, the high line and, and the use of the goalkeeper's distribution. And, and when you play that way, you need um, a top keeper to kind of be brave um, in his decision-making and comfortable in possession. And, and the probably two things that Adrian isn't. He's probably a solid enough shot stopper when they're not getting deflected. Um, but it's a completely different way of playing. And I, I don't know what kind of level goalkeeper needs to come in who's going to be happy to sit on, sit on the bench. And it's a situation that Liverpool have dealt with before with outfield players, but they can generally offer more game time to, to players who are going to be rotating outfield. Goalkeepers, you know, if, if, if Alisson's not injured, then Adrian's only playing in the Carabao Cup and the League Cup, isn't he? And the Carabao Cup is already over, you know, last of the week. So he's not going to be playing until January if Alisson's fit at the earliest. And um, it's a really difficult balance in that. But um, it's probably another headache that Jürgen Klopp thought he might have solved, but um, it's come straight back. Is it a worry, Doyley, when you look at Liverpool's fixtures that <clears throat> Alison Becker could be out for up to six weeks in that time? Liverpool obviously have the Merseyside derby. They start the Champions League campaign away to Ajax. Also have sort of the likes of, of Sheffield United and West Ham to play as well. West Ham, certainly a team who have actually started the Premier League quite well. Is it a worry that Liverpool for an extended period of time might have to rely on Adrian? Um, well, it couldn't have come at a better time, to be honest, because there's two international breaks, so that'll help. Uh, that'll, that'll certainly, you know, there's, there's no game for the next two weeks. And I think they played for three or four, and then they're off for another two. So, in that sense, it's actually, if he's going to be out for six weeks, these are the six weeks that you actually want. Um, but you're right in the sense that the games that Liverpool have got, certainly I'd be more worried about the Champions League ones, get away to Ajax, and I think it's the third game against Atalanta at home, yeah. I must admit, I can't remember. Yeah, that's right. So maybe the, well, again, I mean, we're, we're pretty sure that they're not going to sign a goalkeeper today. And even if we work on the base that Alisson's out for six weeks, then I, I think it will result in a change. Liverpool just have to change the way that they play. The, the, the other thing is, if you look at Aston Villa and how they went for it, as we mentioned, they still coughed up a lot of chances to Liverpool in the first half. Liverpool... You know, this season we're expecting teams to just sit back and they have to pick them apart. Now, Aston Villa might actually end up doing them a little bit of a favour if more teams decide, right, we can have a go at these and Liverpool sort their defence out because it wasn't, you know, it, wanted, it was the best defence last season, so it can't be that bad. It just needs a little bit of a tweak. And then Liverpool can then start taking the chances again and, and, and they'll have more space up front. So I'm not saying there's a positive to be taken out of getting beat 7-2, but... The reality is when you have a scoreline like that, it does have ramifications in both ways because Liverpool cannot play like that again against the team doing that because they'll just lose unless the other team misses loads of chances. Bearing in mind that Villa still missed loads anyway. It's still won 7-2. So there were a lot of awful performances. I know we're talking about Adrian, but you know, we, we could, as I said before, Joe Gomez, Fabinho. Roberto Firmino, I know that Gorsi wrote something which some people weren't happy with, so he's become a problem. Um, but, you know, as, as Joe said, when Alden did his ghost, it was, he had ghost mode on. He's not had that on for about two years. Uh, I think I actually think Keita was a bit unlucky to get subbed at half time, to be honest, because he was involved in the goal and he did have one or two good up, good openings. And certainly he was better than Fabinho and Juan Alden. But I think when there was a substitution had to come, even then, they, they took they put Minamino on, who's basically another forward for a midfielder. So if you want to know why Liverpool was kept on conceding the second half, that's another reason why they thought we'll try and get back into this. And even when Salah scores to make it five two, he's running into the back of the net to get the ball because they think they've got a chance still. So that says a little bit about the way Liverpool think. They think they still win this particular game, even though they're losing five two and coughed up about twenty seven thousand chances by that point. But they can't do that. If they do that against Everton, they'll get absolutely hammered. And that's what, you know, if it was any other opponent than Everton, who, who are now three runaway Premier League leaders, Everton, has to be said, it, it, I don't think Liverpool fans would be worried as much. 
And of course, the other way, the other way around. I mean, we've got a lot of podcasts to do before the derby, and I covered Everton for what was it, eighteen years. There's one thing Everton struggled with is expectation. So it'll be interesting to see how things go before then, how what the mindset is, and what the you know the narrative is heading into that game. Because you know we've seen what was it two weeks ago, Liverpool had won. Uh, Liverpool have had only one seven two scoreline away from home in the history, and now they've had three. <laughs> so that tells you how strange football is at the moment. Yeah, it certainly does. Joe, did it highlight just how important Jordan Henderson is as well? That result doesn't happen if he's in the team, does it? I don't think it does, no. I think I think you're absolutely right. I think that's where Henderson, you know, in that defensive midfield role, just covers so much ground and, and offers Liverpool so much physicality, so much aggression um, and, and so much leadership that, you know what, I, I don't think it happens. I don't think, you know, I'm not saying Liverpool wouldn't have got beat, but I, I don't think they conceded seven goals. Um, and that's not to say about one player, but, you know, I, I think with Jordan Henderson, you know, our times have changed from from him being the one that would get a lot of stick from fans because I think now it's totally obvious that Liverpool miss him a lot when it, when he's not playing. So, um, absolutely, yeah, I think... I think of all the players that they missed last night, other than Alisson, it was, it was him that I was looking at thinking, you know what, I'd have loved to see him in the team. I saw a lot of people saying, oh, I think Patrick's ever talked about it in, uh, in the studio afterwards about Sadio Mane, but I don't actually think Liverpool missed Mane that much last night. As they already said, they created chances. And I think on, a, on another day, they would have scored some more goals, but I just think they missed they missed leadership, they missed physicality, and, and Alisson and, and, and especially Henderson would have been the two players to bring on that. So, yeah, um, you know, that's another thing about this international break. He should be able to get himself fit. I think he is going to go away with England, isn't he, to, to try and build up minutes. And hopefully he comes back and he's in good shape. And I think he's almost a nailed on starter for the derby if um, if he does come back unscathed. Don't want to put words in your mouth, Gorsty, but is <coughs> Roberto Firmino maybe in the opposite position to, to Jordan Henderson? They're a nailed on starter because he, he hasn't, it's probably fair to say, hasn't started the season as well as many would have hoped for him to. No, not at all. I mean, I was quite critical of him in the, in the analysis of the game, um, which is something I've always stayed clear of, of doing because I think he's a fabulous player who, who brings so much to this Liverpool team. Um, he's not your natural number nine or, or your, you know, your, your cliche, you know, goal poacher type, um, you know, your John Alder, your Ian Rush, your Robbie Fowler players who who have been, you know, superstars at this club playing as a centre forward. He's completely different. Um, he operates in a different role. But I just think even even that kind of, <clears throat> there, were, there was two early chances in, in the first half. And I think it might have only been 2-0 at the time or, or 2-1 when... First one, he tries to take an extra touch when Salah slips him in. Um, and another one, he's looking for the teammates when um, Martinez is out of goal instead of just trying to shoot. And it's just kind of th- the moments like that that remind you that he's not your archetypal number nine. And and that is fine, but <clears throat> he only scored one goal at Anfield last season. Most of his goals were important away from home. But um, it's, I, it just feels to me like it's just becoming a little bit of an issue now when... Um, <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, he wasn't the reason that Bill got absolutely hammered 7-2, but um, I just think at some point Pop might have to think maybe perhaps Minamino might you know, take one of these chances a little bit more decisively than, than Firmino has been lately because there was even a chance against Leeds when it was 3-3 and he didn't strike with any conviction at all. I think uh, it was at Messier, the goalkeeper saved it when he, he really should have scored and um, it's fine to overlook the the lack of, of goals when he's bringing so much to the team, you know, in terms of assists and, and contributing to Salah and Mane's brilliance. But I just think um, confidence is a little bit low at the moment, and at some point, minimum, you know, might feel that he's got half a half a chance of of uh, getting another over him. Yeah, well, before we go, I'll come back to, to you, Gorsley. We are recording, of course, on transfer deadline day. Shock horror after uh, some error-prone goalkeeping at Villa Park. Liverpool linked with a goalkeeper today, Paolo uh, Gazaniga from Tottenham Hotspur. And as well as incomings, we sort of alluded to maybe that won't be happening. But outgoings as well. What's the picture at Anfield today? To be honest, um, it looked like it was going to be a busy day. But um, the Gazaniga links with when, when a non-starter. Um, not really sure where they've they've even originated from, if I'm honest. I haven't seen really reported anywhere other than social media, people asking what's going on with it. So 
that, that's not happening. Liverpool were adamant after he signed Jota that the incomings were done, uh, and it would appear to be that way. Um, there's obviously speculation over Shakiri and Gruwich and Wilson. Um, all three were subject of interest from various clubs, two teams after Shakiri, and that's the reason he didn't play. Obviously on Thursday against um, Arsenal in the Carabao Cup. But uh, at the time of recording, it looks like um, he's going to be staying because um, no suitable offers have, have come in. Um, there was a report last week that suggested Burnley had decided to walk away from their interest in Harry Wilson. Liverpool were looking for around about £20 million for him. Um, I'm adamant that he wasn't going on loan. Burnley, not exactly known for, for big spending. I probably think that that's a little bit too much. Um, and uh, As things stand at the moment, it's a similar situation with Grouch. So, um, as we say, as things stand, all three appear to be staying, which um, is probably good news for Liverpool supporters because um, none of those three were going to be replaced. They were all kind of being sold to balance the books, which is no good to supporters. Um, it just means that Liverpool have got more strength and depth. Um, OK, they're not in the Carabao Cup, but it means that we might see Shaqiri a little bit more regularly um, than we, we have over the course of this calendar year. And uh, hopefully if he can get himself fit, he, he still has a, you know, a, a decent part to play in this Liverpool team. Well, if there are any developments on transfer deadline day, do stick across the Liverpool Echo website. The Daily Transfer blog, of course, is in full flow. The deadline until 11 o'clock this evening. But from myself, Guy Clark, Ian Doyle, Joe Rimmer and Paul Gorst, thanks for your time and your company here on the Blood Red Podcast. It's bye for now. This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool